we basically saw a void in the market where not a lot of the rappers at the time were getting booked. <laughs> Hold on, before I go into showing every rolling loud in full detail, which would take forever, but don't worry, I'ma showcase the legendary moments, we gotta talk about how this whole thing even came about. If you're not familiar with these names, Tarek Sharif and Matt Zingler, well, you will after this video. Tarek Sharif and Matt Zingler, both Florida guys, are the co-founders of what we know today as Rolling Loud. Now, if you don't know what Rolling Loud is at this point, you gotta be related to Patrick or something, bro. But anyways. What's the uh, parties you would throw? Well, like where were they? Like? It started in high school. We would throw parties at my grandma's house. Wait, was grandma home? So, at other people's houses is when the parents are out of town. Right. But at grandma's, grandma's there. She's in on it. Oh yeah, yeah. Grandma's, grandma's been a very big piece of like yeah, the building of Rolling Loud. We, we we conceptualize. I like to think we conceptualize Rolling Loud at grandma's house. We used to, she had a sunroom. We would be recording there with up and coming rappers and yeah. stuff. Grandma's the one, man. She, but you were in the house. Yeah, yeah. Did she like bring, they ever bring like snacks? No, she wasn't that type. She would just walk around the party checking it out. She was just happy to have us there. My grandma's like four foot nine. Tarek and Matt actually met at fourth grade. Real day ones, bro. You guys have been friends since like toddlers, right? Fourth grade. Oh. Yeah. Oh, wow. That means that That's like, big. at yeah, the end like, of the day, y'all got each other's back, which is dope. That's rare to find, especially in this industry. Oh, yeah. You never see people that's, like, been day ones, like, really. Day ones. I love Matt with every bone in my body. Growing up, Tarek originally wanted to be a rapper, actually. You just never know where things may end up, Tarek. You know, I started off as an MC. You know, it's, it's music out there mm -hmm. to prove it. You started in the game as a rapper, but you never rapped on this show. You got eight bars for us? Help! Uh, I'll give you a little. I, I'll drop a few bars. I got some old ones. Okay, okay, let's do it. I'm right. I, all right, that's okay, what I'm talking right. about. Okay, let me get something like a pen. Man, this I probably I probably wrote this one in like uh, 2010 or something. Okay, but it was like. I'm a dope individual known for stacking residuals, politicking with criminals and five-star generals of third world countries you ain't never seen and never will. I seen shit that your words can never heal, but I hustled up. Yeah, bro, give me about a month or so. I better stack and stack and stack taller than a month ago. Real shit. And now my baby started teasing as if I need a reason to be scheming for the cream, but I don't. I'm focused like the lens in the shutter. I could keep going, but that was more than eight. Oh, no. yo, 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 he caught, yeah. he caught a ball right there. He said, fall back, fam. Yo, what happened? Why, why, why'd you stop? I mean, you said eight. I felt like I was going too long, but I'll finish it. Okay. Uh... Uh, I'm focused like the lens and the shutter. So zoom into the scene and see I'm sizzling like butter on the pan. As hot as I am, I'll never come down. 
I'm higher than the world trading, bitch. I won't come down till the flow up, till I blow up. I'm switching the flow up and finna roll up. A raw paper filled with chronic words. The Joshi sent me enough packs to never run out. Boxes and boxes. I'm smoking out until the fucking cops come to stop me. Boom! <laughs> Damn! <laughs> that boy got bars, though. <laughs> Let me stop. Tarek and Matt both originally formed their own company at the time around 2009 and 2010 called Dope ENT, where if you actually go on their old YouTube channel, they got videos from at least 10 years ago, bro. Dope shows, no pun intended, they've done in the past. Shows with Kendrick, Currency, MGK, Schoolboy Q, and more. Here's a clip of Tarek talking about how they got into all that. We started out booking shows in Florida, um under our company dope ENT, we basically saw a void in the market where not a lot of the rappers at the time were getting booked for regular concerts like whether it was currency or wale big sean that type of scene at the time 2010 um so we were like hey there's a business there so that's where we started and we just kept building it up more consistently in florida we would do shows in orlando miami tampa sometimes Tallahassee, jacksonville gainesville just kept it real consistent till 2014 and at that point we came up with the concept for rolling loud um we we always used to throw parties like since high school i remember we threw a party for hurricane katrina relief and uh we raised like five grand and donated it to the red cross so i was like the first time i ever saw money off a party then i found out in october 2010 that uh first i got viral meningitis then i found out i was having a kid and lost all my money on my first event it's cool how they noticed that festivals weren't really big on hip-hop like that back then. It was mostly like EDM shit popping at the time. The only things that were really into hip-hop was like Summer Jam or Rock the Bells. That, that time frame, EDM was like the shit. Huge, yeah. It was like, yeah. wherever you went, like there wasn't like a hip-hop night. Like, what were you talking about? Hip-hop almost disappeared. Like it was era. like Ying Yang Twins was the hip-hop night, Yeah. right? Because I'm in Tallahassee, Florida, by the yeah. way, so I'm in the South. So right. like there was like a big disparity of like the yeah. it uh, and then like DJ Khaled, Ying Yang right, Twins, right, right. Birdman. Yeah, Little John. So like that was the scene, and I saw people getting money doing the the EDM promo, paying the nightclub and right. pay and paying the artists and selling the tickets. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, that makes sense. And then I see the hood promoters doing it with the type of hip hop I was just talking about, and I was like, okay, that's cool, but nobody's booking who i'm listening to right now the first quote-unquote real show that Tarek and matt actually set up was an after party back in 2010 where they actually got to book rick ross for it but like he said they ended up losing all their money bruh like what like the obviously current was currency the first event Nah, well it was supposed to be the first event was supposed to be currency but then um that fell through for that time he ended up being like our second but the first thing was a rick ross after party like mm. the opportunity came up that I went to school in Tallahassee. I went to FSU, and FAMU Homecoming is like a big weekend. Of course. So there's a big FAMU Homecoming uh, arena show, mm -hmm. and it had like Rick Ross, uh, DJ Khaled, Waka Flocka. Like this was 2010. Right. So like Makes every sense. like what was popping then, and Rick Ross had like posted on Twitter, back when he had like 200k followers. You know what I'm saying? This like this was early in the game to me at least. Uh, he it was like ricky rose bookings at gmail for after parties i was like yo let's do a rick ross after party we'll make a killing man did you end up killing it no we lost our ass basically we got out promoted by the the arena promoter they were the same promoter as the other nightclub in town so they just um, they just said they had everybody over there um what was the first show you guys made made money off currency of? it was, it was the, the currency so the like second what, show. when we did what we wanted to do like right. the first thing we did was like a, a example of learning the the lesson of like don't jump to opportunities mm -hmm. just because they pop up like it was like all right let's go back to the drawing board and do what we wanted to do we lost a lot of money on rick ross like all the money that we made in college just Blew it. It's kind of crazy because you would think like, damn, bro, this shit just ain't for us. Losing all that money right there. But they didn't stop there. They kept putting in that work and learn from that mistake. But what about Matt Zingler, though? Well, he actually never finished high school on time, but did end up becoming a bioscience major at the University of Florida. Matt pursued the nightlife. He worked as a promoter, bartender, and eventually a nightclub manager. Him and Tarek stayed consistent with their own events, seeing profit at most of their events. Tarek and his girl got hit with an accidental pregnancy at the time, so this gave them an even more reason to start seeing more profit with their shows. 
2014 starts coming around and the surgence of underground acts and that first splurge of SoundCloud rap, such as Xavier Wolf, Denzel Curry, Rob Banks, Puya, Young Simi, just to name a few, were really starting to catch steam. So Tarek and Matt was like, you know what? Let's do it. Let's make our own festival. So in the beginning of 2015, they did it. The first ever Rolling Loud took place on February 28th, 2015 in Miami, Florida. Unfortunately for them though, there was a huge storm that took place that day, but they still ended up making it work. And looking back at it now, legendary fam. Let's liven it up, man. We're in here. Dopey and T, Rolling Loud Festival coming up. What's up? We got our oh, first call in. Hold up, hold up. Yo, you got free tickets to Rolling Loud, bro. You the winner, my G. As soon as this song ends, I need that phone line blowing up. Screenshot proving that they've called 74 times. I just called over 90 times. Someone said it rang and then it wasn't available. We're sorry, man. It's a lot of calls coming in and the phones can only take so many calls. We need new phones. We need new studios. Hi, you're on the Hip Hop Shop. It's WVUM. Nope. Today, South Florida was hit with heavy thunderstorms and 50 mile per hour winds. Oh Streets God. are flooded in Miami. So Up to six inches of heavy rain fell in Miami today, flooding streets and neighborhoods. No, really. The five to six inches downtown Miami saw today is more than double what it usually sees for the this entire month of February. Even main roads like Biscayne Boulevard were almost impassable. I've never seen rain like this. <laughs> Everybody was just fleeing for cover. So ro the first Rolling Loud lost a hundred grand, and the second one made that back plus some. So the second Rolling Loud, like yeah. coming back on top, that was like the most. That to me, that's the most memorable because like we weren't sure it was gonna work. Right. It was like, is are we? If it doesn't work this time, other festivals somehow have done historically 10 years of loss before they started is that the number that's what i would say you yeah like uh, if you look at festivals like ultra like they lost a lot of money for years before they started making money and in our situation we were actually able to change that in our second year which is amazing it kind of worked out perfectly for them because 2016 which is the greatest year of all time was the year that hip-hop changed forever an old head's nightmare where the quote-unquote mumble rap generation took the world by storm rappers like uzi yachty famous dex 21 savage kodak black was the hottest shit on earth so rolling loud just felt like the perfect blend for the culture x's performance on the little tent stage is one of my favorite performances of all time man just the whole energy from everyone no cell phones just people going crazy turning up bro real fans for real <laughs> Now 2017 comes along and whew, oh boy, 
The Florida SoundCloud wave just started swarming in, bro. They were already buzzing, but these artists like Smoke Perp, Lil Pump, X, Ski, Wi Fi's Funeral, you name it, were starting to really skyrocket. So it was just a perfect thunderstorm of timing for Rolling Loud. 2017's Rolling Loud was super legendary. Who can forget when Uzi jumped off that balcony type shit? Bro, come on, that was legendary. <laughs> And of course, X's legendary performance. And I mean legendary. Yo, take a shot every time I say legendary. <laughs> I mean, damn, bro. I wish I was there. The fact that he had the whole crowd chanting, fuck Drake, when Drake is the biggest artist in the world and you're an up and coming artist, bro, that shit is wild. That fan base is diehard for real. Oh, wow. That's how you feel? That's how you feel? Fuck Drake. Fuck Drake. Alright, nice. Run that shit. It was also the first time Rolling Loud was three days at that point. So that just goes to show how successful it was becoming. The lineup was sick too with Rocky, Wayne, Kendrick, Doug, Future, and Travis headlining on separate days. And speaking of lineups, that's gotta be the most stressful thing for Tyreek and Matt to figure out, bro. Cause you know people wanna try to see everyone. Tyreek says he tries his best to separate artists that are within the same fan base. So for example, he would never put Playboy Cardi and Uzi on separate stages at the same time because he knows that the fans wanna see both. But for headlines the same day, he has to put heavy hitters against each other because then it'll be a capacity issue and a dangerous scenario where everyone floods one stage and not too many go to the others. So I get it, it just sucks because speaking from a personal perspective, that shit is tough, man. When you got like three of your favorite artists all, you know what I'm saying, headlining on different stages, it's like, oh man, who do I choose, bro? What, what I always wondered too is with festivals a lot of times man like let's say for example hypothetically you got j cole on one stage and travis scott on the other stage and then they're performing at the same time but i want to see both do you do you get you get that feedback sometimes that damn man the two i mean we won't put the we won't put the something that big up against each other but we do have to um we do have to put artists up against each other for capacity reasons if you had mm -hmm. you know two if you had only one artist performing at a time on one stage and everybody would go to that stage, the other stages would be empty mm. and oh. it, it becomes like a crowd flow issue and a capacity issue. Mm -hmm. um, basically, we'd have to sell way less tickets. And then if we sell way less tickets, then we're booking way less artists. So it's mm. a balance, right? But we yeah. try very hard to curate it in a way that, like I said, the different, different types of fans are going to still be able to see the artist they want so like we won't put like a play playboy cardi up against Lil uzi vert because like we know that those right, fans want right. to be both you know I i'd put a you know i'd put currency up against playboy cardi because like currency fans aren't really tripping about going to a playboy cardi set they okay. want to just go vibe mm -hmm. to some spitter mm -hmm. i see what you're so, saying so so what do you do in the case of you know the rap gang got a lot of a lot of beef <laughs> You know what I mean? If you got people who uh, who are are in conflict on the same show, how do y'all like security wise? How do how have y'all prepped? So for the beef stuff, we try to if anybody's got beef on the lineup, we try to separate them on different days. Okay. And yeah. then not not allow the you know not allow them to come on the other days. Also, we just have a strict no gun policy. So we're we're searching at, at the at the artist at all entries but especially the artist entry just talking to all the teams as well and doing our mm -hmm. own research about the beast and just trying to keep people separate i mean obviously we've had a couple fights at rolling loud but nothing too crazy Man, you already know, bro. Like, where do I even begin? I mean, shit, we spoke about some legendary ones already, but I mean, off the top of my head, Lil Peep performing at the Bay. Looking back at it now, that's pretty legendary. Or shit, how about when X performed Fuck Love with Trippy? Bruh, come on. Legendary. <laughs> I'm a 
Or how about when him, Yachty, and Rocky rocked out for Look At Me? Rare as fuck. Or of course when X and Ski performed together at two different sets in 2018 and they finally became cool again, man, that was so fire to see. I'm really glad that happened for real. Hey, Negro, yo, with the do rag on. Yo, bro, I love you, bro. I love uh, you too, huh? I love you, bro. Play that shit. <laughs> Or when Yachty surprised Trippy in 2018 Miami, that was pretty fire to me. Hold on, hold on, trip, 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 hold on, hold on, trip. Trip. Who said my name? Hold on, hold on, trip. Trip, nah, you can't leave yet, trip. Why can't I? What you got, DJ? Shit, there's so many other moments. Oh, how about at Miami 2019? That boy Uzi talking about, y'all ready to hear my album? Yeah. Uh-uh, that's not like y'all ready to hear somebody else's album. <laughs> he said, he said, y'all ready? Okay, bye. And motherfucker just left. I finished the last song to the album. Ain't this about a bitch? So y'all ready for this motherfucking album? No, I don't sound like y'all ready. I sound like y'all ready for somebody else's album. I said y'all ready for my album? Okay, bye. Repeat after me! I don't know if that's legendary, but that's that's definitely memorable for me. There was actually like a false alarm that happened at Miami 2019 where people thought there was a shooting. People were running, screaming. Shit was like a stampede from what I heard. Like people were dead ass scared for their life, bro. And they had to let the crowd know like there's no shooting. There's no shooting. <laughs> Crazy. Or shit. DMX performing is pretty legendary too. R.I.P. <laughs> Shout out to the 175 crew always turning up at shows. They got a lit ass vlog from the DMX set. Bro, look how crazy this shit is. Or how about the first Rolling Loud in New York, which was actually my first Rolling Loud in October of 2019. That shit was so fun, man. I was tight they put ASAP Rocky and Uzi at the same time, though. I low-key regret seeing Uzi because Rocky's set looked way more lit when I watched videos, bro. And he brought out 50? Come on, bro. What up, blood? What, what up, blood? It's all good though because it all came back full circle two years later when I saw 50 and he brought out Rocky. I'll show that in a second. Seeing Travis Scott like tear his ACL right in front of me, that shit was crazy.
know what else was pretty legendary from this weekend? When MGK thought he was Jeff Hardy, fam. That boy was standing on the top of the fucking pillar thing, bro. It had to have been like 100 feet up. That shit was crazy. Playboy Cardi set, bro. That was the whole like whole lot of red V1 era with all the leaks and shit. And he posted on his Instagram that night, 48 hours locked in or some shit like that. Yeah, that shit was fun as hell. <laughs> But nah, for me, the most legendary thing was seeing Juice World, bro. I'm so glad I got to see him. It was either him or Young Thug, but I already saw Thug like three times prior to that. It was super legendary for me. And he brought out Fabio Foreign when I didn't even know who that was, to be honest with you. That shit was dope. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Crazy thing is, at the next Rolling Loud in LA that year, they had a whole tribute for him, fam. <sighs> Probably the saddest set in Rolling Loud history, bruh. Then we got hit with COVID, bruh, which obviously was a blow to everyone in the world, where we actually still had Rolling Loud, but virtually. <laughs> bro, it was the weirdest shit ever. Everybody had to perform in front of TV screens, bro. That shit was so weird. I ain't gonna lie, though. I was watching that shit live and mosh pitting in my own room, just turning up, throwing the pillows around, breaking shit. <laughs> like, it was, they did what they had to do. It was, it was different for sure. Do whatever I want, don't give a fuck, live my life, uh -huh, uh -huh. And Rolling Loud got delayed like three times till it finally happened in July of 2021 in Miami. It was the first like big event to go down after covid too bruh they even did a whole friday night smackdown set hey bro if that's not legendary then i don't know what is oh, dawkins putting out a clinic angelo dawkins planting gable i remember being skeptical like hmm i don't know i don't trust it yet <laughs> but i did end up going to new york's rolling loud 2021 and damn bro what a great time i met a lot of dope people and it was three days this time as opposed to 2019 which was two days i vlogged the whole thing just check the playlist tab on my channel <laughs> Let me give you a 
Northern New York, the other Sunday areas that love me out to you. Yo, Pinky. Hands down, the most legendary set from that whole weekend was definitely Playboy Cardi, bro. What a difference it was from two years before, which don't get me wrong, was lit as hell. But this time, with a whole lot of red still fresh, and it started pouring rain as soon as his set started, bro. It was literally iconic, fam. And he brought out Uzi? Come on, bro. It's crazy because to be honest, I didn't even know he brought out Uzi till I was on my way home. My boy texted me like, yo, you just witnessed history. I'm like, huh? The reason why I didn't know was because it was so dark, plus it was raining. Everyone where I was at was just focusing on the mosh pit, to be honest. No one was really looking at the stage. Either way, that was probably the litest set I've ever been a part of in my entire life. I did see J. Cole's performance that night too on YouTube. Bro, that shit looked legendary too. Like if Playboy Cardi wasn't going on the same time as Cole, I probably Probably would have went to that. If we gonna stand in the rain, it gotta be worth it. Let's do this shit. First things first, as a piece of. One time for my LA sisters. One time for my. But I did end up seeing him in Cali a few months later when I went in December. Again, you could check the vlogs, and that was so fun too, fam. Seeing Kid Cudi, Future, Sway Lee was actually phenomenal, I won't lie. Chief Keef, Sheck West, like, it was fire as fuck. But nothing, and I mean nothing, will ever top when Future brought this man out, bro. Oh, and I can't forget I got to see the GOAT Chris Breezy? What? Legendary. For me personally, seeing Kid Cudi, bro, man, so legendary for me, bro. Especially since it was the first time he was performing Man on the Moon 3. Wow, that shit was so fire, bro. And I ain't gonna lie, Playboy set? Bro, it was low-key just as lit as New York rolling loud. Just with no rain. And he had the horns and shit, screaming, I love you, I love you! I'm so fucking high! Whatever, bro, it's screaming. That shit was fire, bro.
It's crazy because five years ago when Tarek was asked who would be his dream headliner, he said this. Who's your dream headliner, man? Is it is it uh, is it Kanye? I uh, yeah, I have to pick one. I mean, that's like, not with, fair because then say, the other one's gonna get. Mad. It's Drake or Kanye. Drake or Kanye. Those are the two. Because we already booked Wayne, so like True. now I'm like. Dude, I booked Wayne twice, and I want to book him more and more. Bro, he's the best. And look who's booked for this summer's Miami Rolling Loud, bro. Yeezy and Kendrick in future, bro. Bro, you already know, fam. Expect that vlog. So yeah, man, Rolling Loud. What Tarek and Matt has created is one of the dopest things I've ever been a part of, bro. So many legendary and iconic moments from it, and I'm sure it ain't gonna end anytime soon. What are some of your favorite moments from Rolling Loud? Let me know in the comments, fam. And if you rock with this video, do a backflip on that subscribe button. Ask it! Ask it! Ask it!